Hi, Zoran. Welcome back. Hi, hi, Adam. Good to be back. Nice to see you again. Yeah, and today we should be a little bit more technical. So the last time we had a lot of chat, you know, what was your first computer and what was your first mouse? Now it's over. Yes. I, I don't care about your computers anymore. Just about, uh, you know, <laughs> machine learning and deep nets. Yes, we, we are going to talk about personal AIs. That's why I saw that the company is building personal robots. So it's like interesting to see that a while ago there was a, why would anybody need their personal computer? But now yeah, we are talking about personal robots and probably something like that will happen. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the main uh, topic that uh, we're going to chat about today is the project that I'm working on uh, at the moment uh, for, for a few years, actually. Uh, it's called DeepNets. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is a deep learning development platform that's uh, targeting Java developers. So uh, historically looking, uh, deep learning and machine learning uh, was mainly uh, developed uh, on a Python platform and uh, C++, of course. And uh, most of the tools and most of the, of the innovations uh, comes from that space. Uh, there is, of course, a very good reason for that because these new things that require uh, high computing power using GPUs and uh, uh, first uh, frameworks that uh, allow that enabled uh, researchers to quickly run experiments uh, uh, came from that technology stack. Uh, there were some, uh, there still are uh, several uh, other uh, uh, Java-based solutions, but uh, to my personal uh, feel was that uh, it's not, uh, uh, they do not have Java the flavor. So they are not uh, uh, what Java developers would expect uh, in a way uh, like for developing experience, for being user-friendly, for having tools that will help them uh, through the process. And uh, th that was mainly the inspiration and motivation for deep nets. And uh, also, uh, the, the our last time we talked about the Neuroff project, it was like um, my small uh, student project that evolved into open source project uh, that became quite popular, uh, where people recognized that, that kind of uh, Java API style and uh, ease of use. And uh, there is a, a community that, that uh, um, benefits and favors that kind of uh, uh, libraries. Yeah. So put so two, we are two talking... two together, that's how the tests were born. Yeah, we, we are talking yeah. now about deep nets. So this is deep nets with two T's.com. And yes, uh, yes. I actually can concur because um, I look at the code and uh, I was surprised. So what I expected, you know, lots of C-like code, which looks like crap. <laughs> I would say lots of underscores, <laughs> but but it is not, exactly. the not, the not, not the case at all. And uh, what I was really pleasant, pleasantly surprised is it looks... It look, looks like very more than Java. I would say not even, you know, like uh, not what you, you are accustomed to in JDK 1.3, more like, you know, Java 11 or Java 17. To give you an example, yeah. for instance, if you would like to read a CSV, right? So uh, you, you mm -hmm. have one class called Dataset. And you remember the method yes. name? Now, now you are on the spot. What's the name? What's the method name? Read, read CSV. Yeah, read CSV. Very, very good. So you are the right man, man here. So uh, <laughs> read CSV. Then the next line is data set, train, test, split, and then we have max yes. normalizer, and we have feed forward network and back propagation trainer. But um, sure. it is builder pattern. So the nice story yeah. is you say forward uh, network builder at input layer at fully connected layer at output layer and uh, and so yeah. forth. So I would say the entire example is, I mean, this is differently formatted, but it's more like seven lines of code and um, yeah. with two lines of uh, logging. This is the first example from your web page. And, um, mm -hmm. and um, I like it. So uh, I, I expected oh, some, right. yeah, I expected something else. Uh, I I thought you know uh, what what you did is more like you know the mad scientist approach to that. But, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yes. no, but this is <laughs> but this is usable. And what I also appreciate, uh, you have only two dependencies. So this is you know you have the um, DeepNets Core Pro, and then DeepNets License, which uh, is uh, maybe business needs for the license. Yes. 
list. But um, I like single dependency frameworks. This is what I like. Yeah. If you if yes. you would say I would have to install you know super pom with uh, bomb and and fifty dependencies, I'm immediately lose yeah. the interest a little mm-hmm. bit. Exactly, exactly. And there are a few more dependencies uh, we are losing uh, using a uh, log for J for logging, and uh, also well, I should hey, mention why, why 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 not Java U two logging? Well, uh, at some point, uh, I don't remember exact reason why, but uh, I think I needed uh, like uh, uh, some features from Java from Apache log for J, okay. and uh, yeah. At first, uh, what I did, I used this um, uh, self for, self for J, but then uh, yeah, it was too, too too heavy, and I did did most of the things. I don't remember okay. why, but uh, yeah, uh, it, I think at first I used Java logging, mm-hmm. but at some point uh, I needed. I said, I tell you, yeah, I need this. I don't want to reimplement this on my uh, own. I'm going to use the, some existing library. So so, so that, that's the reason. Okay, uh, and uh, I really appreciate what you said. And uh, my original in- intention uh, when designing DeepNets was to make uh, uh, API that's uh, readable, intuitive, and Java developer friendly. So even if you're not uh, li- like an expert and know all the uh, technical details and mathematics behind it, uh, machine learning that you you would be able to effectively use it to to solve the problem that uh, you're working on. So uh, I really am very happy to hear these uh, comments from you because I, it's kind of a proof of concept that uh, uh, we have achieved that uh, that goal. Yeah, I, I look at the code. So I have to admit, my first my my, my first reaction was. Uh, give me the terminal. I would like to try it out. You know, this is what because oh, I saw perfect. because because I saw perfect. one one dependency, the build the like style, yeah. and then the Duke yeah. video. What I also looked, uh, which was also nicely done. <laughs> so um, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. I think we can we could actually take the video because this is on your page, so everyone can look at this. It's like three minutes. Yes. And, uh, yes. and 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 talk about what happens behind the scenes because it's really nice. It seems like um, this is um, you are using uh, like a workbench. Uh, uh, looks like NetBeans mm-hmm. based workbench to set up the project. Yes. But it, what I also noticed, this is just my impression, the workbench is optional because what it does, it creates configuration files which can be uh, used outside, which is also important to me. You know, I am absolutely not interested in yeah. some, you know. Uh, IDE dependencies. Even I like you no know, NetBeans a lot, um, but I'm not interested to be depending on NetBeans. So this is why I like it. Of but, course, of yeah. course, of course, yeah. of course. And okay. uh, what you did, it seems like you are reading Dukes and uh, Duke pictures, uh, different Duke pictures, yes. and you yeah. are uh, classifying them. But uh, the interesting part is um, you see what happens behind the scenes. So this is kind of visual debugger, what I understand. So you see, you exactly, know, uh, what exactly. what the AI does. And I would say yes. this is great because, you know, the the debugging of AI, for me, it was always a huge problem because you do something, you have no idea what happens, and then you get the solution, but no one knows whether the solution is right. So with that, yes. I see more like, you know, uh, okay, um, you know, the Duke looks like this for the AI, and this is this layer and this layer. Maybe we should start with the very first step. What I assume what happens is you are reading the pictures byte-wise. Uh, what usually happens, you're scanning the pictures you know, in, a, in a byte array, right? This is the first step. Yes. yes. Uh, well, uh, the first first step is, of course, to, to prepare the, the image set that you want to train a model for. Mm-hmm. So it exists about uh, 50 e- images of uh, Duke mm-hmm. with, in different po- po- positions with different variations. And like uh, 50 images that do not contain Duke. Some of them are, are random images. Some of them are just are random colors in order to avoid, uh, you know, detection of a specific. If you find an image with a little bit of a black and a white and mm-hmm. a red, then it can be recognized as a Duke, like a little bit of false recognition. So you just... Draw a little, a little bit of images uh, that do not represent you. How how, how many step, how, how many dukes do you need to to have something reasonable? Well, it it depends how much uh, how much uh, generality you want to achieve. How mm-hmm. much do you want to generalize, and how much do you want to be accurate with uh, different variations of duke? <clears throat> I mean, this is a 
obviously hello world examples so like 100 images uh, is more than enough <clears throat> however it is possible to uh, use options from development tool and generate additional images using technique called data augmentation which is basically generating different variations of the given images uh, with different uh, uh, levels of gray lightning rotation and uh, so on but this is but uh, basically you could generate new variations of duke or or new uh, variations of uh, how to call it of the color settings and you know this the uh, the uh, the appearance of the duke right yes 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 you can you, the, um, i don't have many options for that but, but some basic with a different col with different uh, coloring Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, different uh, brightness, for example, and then flipping image, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from level, flip, flip horizontally, flip vertically, uh, and you can specify how many of these variations you want to generate, and it will be automatically generated for you. But uh, it, as I said, it, it depends how much uh, do you want to get uh, uh, tolerance to different variations. Um, mm -hmm. It is desirable to get some, but... Uh, Usually, you don't need uh, like a, too, too much of that. So, so to my, for my understanding, let's say I only have you know five images, but to train the model, I need more. So then I would use a separate tool, yes, read the yes. five images, and generate you know some images with errors or the blurs or whatever to to train the model better. Right? This is yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 And how this technique is called again? Well, data augmentation. Data augmentation. Image augmentation. Okay. And, uh, image augmentation. and the all the Duke images are of the same size or uh, have to be or well uh, they are, are, are scaled rescaled to same size originally they are not of the same size but when you fit the model mm -hmm. uh, they all have to fit the model input size yeah so they are all rescaled to the same size because are, because uh, the model uh, needs a two dimensional array right this is what you yes. have so this yes. is like uh, actually, actually, byte, it, array, it, it, byte it, it, array, it, it, yeah. Sorry, it is actually a three-dimensional array. Oh, because okay. uh, you have two dimensions, but you have red, green, and blue channels. So you have one channel for uh, one dimension for each uh, color channel. Ah, so you have uh, so there is like two-dimensional array for one color. So you have three, um, yes, three yes. layers on top of each other, right? So this is like yes, yes. Okay, yes, nice. Yes. So they didn't knew that. I, I thought you know if you do AI on pictures, you are always reading. But you are right. The pixels have yeah. There is so you're separating the colors. Okay, interesting. Um, so yeah, that no. that then the, this, this is, is yes. mm -hmm, sorry. So, no, no, okay. And, and all, all these details are handled under the hood. There is a cast called example image, you know, mm -hmm. and there is the image set. So all these details is something that uh, you as an end user don't have to worry about. Uh, it has already been solved for you, you know. So just we are talking to explain how it works. But when you do, uh, the, the whole point is when you start working with images, you work with image files and you, you don't care how image stores pixels and about the internal details uh, of image and how do you you know, feed the, the these pixels to, to the network. You, mm -hmm. you just get a, a nice, nice looking Java object with a clear API and uh, uh, readable methods, and you just feed it. So. Yeah, exactly. And the API is really clean. So kudos again to you. So to all listeners, oh, they have to, to take a look on that because because it. This is what I like. You know, I, I think that developer experience and usability is key. This is uh, yes, yeah. We don't have time, yeah. you know, to, uh, to to play with thousands of getters and setters. I would say. Uh, I hear many tweet quotes coming from this session <laughs> by me <laughs> from you. Um, ho yeah, hopefully, yeah, hopefully. So, uh, I, I, yeah. I, uh, which image formats are you uh, are you supporting? Can it be JPEG, PNG, or GIF? Yes, it can be anything. Uh, anything that is. Uh, uh, currently supported uh, by the J uh, Java Image IO, you know, oh, okay. mm -hmm. we did this buffered image. Mm -hmm. So th there is there are challenges there also, and th that's something that uh, we are currently working on. Uh, and one of the problem is to solve the uh, Java Im imaging on Java platform. There are many different libraries and uh, formats, uh, not just uh, for um, in files, but when you load these images in memory. 
And for example, the, there is a problem with Android because the, it is using bitmap. So one of the reasons why we started the uh, visual recognition API, uh, JSR, uh, like a Java standard, is to enable working with different types of images and different uh, formats, uh, different classes for images, and to make it irrelevant, you know, which, uh, uh, which, uh, on which platform and which uh, e imaging class, class library uh, somebody is using, but they can use uh, this uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning uh, in Java with any type of images. Yeah. Because that's something that, that that's really, you know, uh, requires you to dig deeper and f figure out what, what, what works with what. And there are the, like uh, different formats for microscope images, different formats so astronomy images and different th type of imaging libraries for everything. So we tried to create like a abstraction and API that will enable we're using different, even different machine learning libraries with different types of imaging formats. And, uh, you know, you can use it the same way and maybe replace uh, the machine learning engine, use different imaging library on different platforms and, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm and, thinking and about, way, this is why I'm asking, what I will try to do is just uh, write a simple program with deep nets. And uh, what I would like to recognize, uh, is it a person? Is it Duke? Or is it the, you know, the Lego, Lego creature this should be easy right yeah so it will yes, uh, this yes, should, yes. because they are very different you know but this would be because you have different dukes is harder but uh just this is interesting i mean so, because they are yes, so, yes, so, so different easy. between uh, no person a yellow lego creature and duke there's so much difference so you don't need i hope too many pictures and and then it should work yes. pretty well right Yes, yes. Uh, I, ideally, you have like start with ten pictures of each. Yeah. And uh, uh, and uh, it's a multi-class classification problem mm -hmm. because you have several types of objects. Duke is a binary classification because you have like a, only one object. It's a, it's a duke or not a duke. Mm -hmm. But when you have a several uh, categories of objects, it's a multi-class classification. And there are examples. That, that that's a one thing. Uh, th there are examples uh, that will help you get started immediately. So you can just a little bit uh, look at the code, understand what's going on, and modify the example to to work for for you. And uh, even if you use tool, uh, which is by the way free, uh, free to download and use for for development purposes, it is even easier and gives you more options. And uh, one of the main problems it solves is that uh, allows you to quickly experiment with different settings and guides you, especially if it is something that you're doing for the first time, uh, you don't understand maybe all the settings and how, how to use them. And it, it provides you with a reasonable default that things which uh, work uh, in most cases. Yeah, this is what I saw in your workbench. So it was like I had a layer, layer yes. one algorithm yes. and, and, and got the result. And um, yeah, which... It, it, it is a very... Kind of level of wizard because it asks you what do you want to do? Do you want to recognize images or want to, you want to uh, predict the value and uh, you want to work with data and classify data? Then in the next step, it asks you how uh, do you have uh, like uh, two types of images or more types of images that it requires like a, and replaces like a very low level technical machine learning terms with uh, something that a general user understands. He knows what he wants to achieve and uh, Guides you step by step in the process, and and uh, like one of the the current development uh, targets is to be like a an expert assistant. Uh, part of it already exists there that will really uh, understand what are you trying to do and uh, provide uh, like a better like initial settings uh, and guidance uh, to the process. So okay. even if you're not an expert in ML, you will be able to to, to create something that works like. So now uh, I, I would like to step through the entire process. This is my goal for today, as I saw you know your, the code. So the first thing is, yeah. you you read the dukes uh, into some into th into two three dimensional array, but you know the first two dimensions is x and y, and then are the three dimensions are the R, G, and B. So read green and blue. So what I'm understanding is, and this is now enough, yes. you know, for your AI to to or to train the model. 
this is enough to train the model. Yeah. So you need uh, some kind of normalization. So I, I, probably you stretch the images or because you, you need, you know, the same amount of pixels, I, I suppose, right? Otherwise, uh, yes. yeah. Yes. So what happens next? Because what I saw, the, you have multiple layers. And uh, my understanding, what you are doing is, is like, you know, you have the input layer and there are a couple layers in between and there is like, yeah, the result is the output layer. And uh, the your machine learning stuff just connects, you know, the dots between. Thus, you know, the it, it it makes the signal flow between in the black box, and I get the result back. This is a I would say, ten seconds, you know, uh, <laughs> explanation. Yes, that's what, pretty, yes, pretty much it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So now, um, like yeah. And um, so. Okay, so what is the first step? What you, you what you are doing in this example? So just the example from your video. This is important for your listeners. You know mm -hmm. the, the the Duke example. So what happens first? Uh, well, first uh, there is a, like a forward pass, and you in which uh, you, you feed the image to the input of mm -hmm. the network, mm -hmm. and then network performs calculation and uh, uh, provides uh, uh, like a guess whether the input is uh, Duke or not Duke. But uh, let's say the first comes the training phase. Yeah. And during this training phase, uh, you feed the network with images yeah. and you feed w what is the output, the uh, like information, is it a Duke or is it not a Duke? And when network gets prediction, whether it is a Duke or not Duke, it calculates the error of how much it, it missed, uh, uh, like a probability estimation. So mm -hmm. a network, uh, the output gives a probability that the given image belongs to a specific category. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on the difference between uh, the, the uh, predicted probability and the actual probability, which is uh, given in, uh, as a part of a training set, uh, the network calculates error uh, and then uh, uses that information to adjust internal parameters in order to become closer to, to, to the correct prediction. So what I will have and, to do uh, is I, I have the 30 pictures or let's say 20, person or duke, just for mm -hmm. me, you know, I have person or duke. So I would mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, read, let your machine learning software read it. And then I would just tell from mm -hmm. the beginning, dukes or not dukes. And uh, the, the, your machine learning software, uh, uh, sorry, your model training software will uh, mm -hmm. calculate the error internally and try to adjust until threshold is met so i i think what yes. will what will also happen is like backtracing internally maybe or you say okay I'm, I'm i'm going to wrong direction i have to to roll back something like this maybe happens internally as well right that yes. your training yes. model yes. you say okay okay uh you know the arrow gets greater and greater whatever strategy i i th i thought about is wrong so i could roll back this decision and do something different right this can happen yes yes uh, basically uh, the error should always go go down. Exactly. The, the, the core algorithm is uh, uh, finding the minimum error for the given data set and the given network. And if it is growing, then uh, usually something is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the, the architecture is not good, uh, uh, maybe the data is not good, or some of the training settings are not good. Mm -hmm. So the, this development tool, the goal of the development tool is actually to help you to debug different uh, settings and uh, try to, 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 to understand what's going on by visualizing the uh, operation of the model. Mm -hmm. How long such a training lasts? So how, how long time do I need to train? Let's say 30 well, pictures? It really depends a lot of uh, the, the size of the data set and, uh, uh, and, and the number number of images and the size of the model. And the Duke, I mean, we, just when we're talking about the Duke, you know, the, the Duke. Uh, few minutes. I mean, I mean, even Duke, less than a minute. Less than less, a minute. Less than a minute. Uh, and in your example, you try to recognize the Duke or you try to recognize different Dukes? What you did actually? Uh, to, 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 to recognize the Duke. There, there are many different images of, of, of the Duke. So there this is what are I saw. Exactly. Variations. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But uh, I, I just want to give an output. Is it a duke or is it not a duke? So ju just the binary. Okay. True false. True false. True false. So it it learned duke and whatever looks not like a duke is not a duke. So this is what what you yes. did. Okay. Yes. So so my example yes. would be even a little bit more complicated because I will need to you know a person or a duke or something else, right? 
Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, it, it won't be a problem. No, no. Uh, just thinking about this. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, uh, and uh, you train the model. When you know that is done, I guess uh, you have to provide a threshold, right? Say, do as long as you need for 80% correctness or 90%, right? This is what I have to do. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, you have like uh, uh, two, two, two settings uh, uh, that control how long you're going to train. And that it also decides on a specific problem. Uh, uh, th there is like a error threshold when the total error comes below that threshold, the training stops. Uh, and there is number of training iterations, number of epochs that you want to do. Sometimes uh, if the training, uh, if the uh, error threshold uh, might not be reached, then you you don't want to train forever, obviously. So th that's uh, why you say I'm going to train this for uh, 100 iterations or 1000 iterations. And if, if I don't reach error threshold, then the, don't continue training at all. We start something else. Or maybe if the accuracy, uh, because uh, each training uh, uh, step uh, provides uh, detailed logging about the uh, error threshold and the accuracy. And once you see the accuracy going above 90%, then it is good time to, to uh, stop. Okay. Because you don't want to overfit the model. You know, there's a thing with machine learning. You don't want to get really high accuracy with the training data because later uh, it might lose the generality and it provide the uh, worse results with uh, data it has not seen during the training that is the test test set so, so, so for me to, to understand if you if you do it for too long it will recognize exactly this what what you give the model yes. and, and and it will be less variation okay okay so uh, it, it mm -hmm. won't be it won't be good for recognizing if they have a little bit of variations. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it will be bad for recognizing that, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay. And and uh, all the layers are part of the training. Do I have to specify the layers, or it happens automatically? So for the training, so I already have right. So prepare. Well, at, at the moment, at the moment, uh, you have to specify all the layers. Okay. So. Uh, and, uh, what I have to do? So how many layers would, would I need roughly and what is the thinking behind? So let's say I would like to do this. Uh, uh, I would like, you know, to create your example from scratch with the Dukes. So uh, mm -hmm. do I need one layer, two, three, or how to start, how to think about this? Well, start, uh, uh, I mean, th there are also different types of layers you, you can use. Uh, and uh, each type of layer has a different... Uh, purpose in, mm -hmm. in the network and just to go briefly on them there is a convolutional layer mm -hmm. which uh, basically detects features it learns it, it can be trained to to detect features different uh, uh, patterns of uh, pixels and colors you know mm -hmm. uh, and uh, th there is a pooling layer usually max pooling layer which is down downsizing the the, the input image you know uh, and uh, at the end, there is this so-called fully connected layer, which are basically performing classification. Mm -hmm. So uh, typically, uh, you need a few uh, blocks of uh, convolutional and max pooling layers, and then uh, at the end, a uh, few uh, these uh, well, uh, up to three, um, you know, one or up to three, uh, these fully connected layers. So the, the what I usually start with is I just put one convolutional and one max pooling layer and one fully connected layer, which is basically uh, approximately the same size of the output layer or even a little better, a uh, little bigger, and then see what do I get. And if we, you don't have to use the, the, the whole idea is that you don't have to use uh, the big network to, to get some usable results, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's, uh, many people are actually going for using a uh, huge, large networks like ImageNet and uh, uh, pre-trained models with uh, billions of parameters. And if you need to recognize just a few hundreds of images, you know, you don't need that. And, and this is the whole point, and this is the, the niche for, for, for the deep nets. Because if you have a really huge model, then you really need a lot of data to train well that model. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think nobody is capable of gathering uh, like a, a million of images, you know, for, for training some to, to see if something works in test. So like a, 
So the whole idea with DeepNet is that you can start with small model and like a, uh, see see what it works, and then you can gradually increase the complexity. If if you see that you're uh, totally missing the predictions, then of course you need a bigger model. And then if you're still missing, uh, it doesn't work, then you maybe need more data. And then it's iterative process where you're experimenting with the training and, and the data set. So back to uh, how many layers you need. Uh, as I said, start with the one convolutional, one max pooling, and one fully connected, which is approximately the same size of output mm -hmm. or bigger. What, what, do you and, understand, uh, uh, what do you understand under big model? Is a big model, it means it has many layers? Or what is what means big? Deep model. Uh, let's say deep, oh, yes. The deep, model many deep, layers, deep, okay. Deep, deep, deep. So what I'm curious and, about is the, is the max pool uh, max pool layer. What happens if I leave it out? So what it does? Uh, it it uh, re reduces the dimension of the problem. Let's put it like that, you know. Okay. For, for example, if you have, if you have like uh, 100 times 100 pixels input image, mm -hmm. you have 10,000 inputs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, at the output, you you want to get uh, uh, you, uh, actually 30,000 inputs because there are th the three channels. Exactly. So 10,000 pixels and 30,000 inputs. And the output, you have just the one input, which is same probability from yes to no, mm -hmm. you know, from all those pixels. So... What uh, what's going on uh, through the network is uh, it is learning patterns in pixels, but also downscaling the uh, image in each layer. So if at the first uh, layer you have one one hundred times one hundred, after it goes through max pooling layer, it will be fifty times fifty, and if it goes again through next uh, convolutional and max pooling layer, it will become twenty five times twenty five, ah. and so on. At the end, last, uh, ideally, uh, you need to have so many uh, uh, convolutional and max pooling blocks. So the last uh, layer of, of these uh, uh, blocks uh, comes to like a, just a one-dimensional vector, you know. Okay. And when you get that, then you can feed it uh, next to, to, to feed forward. Uh, to feed forward uh, uh, layers. Because it's almost like a projection, right? So like you have... Uh... Exactly, exactly. Each layer is performing kind of projection. That's uh, absolutely 100% true for these fully connected layers. They are on projecting inputs into a space of uh, different dimensions. Okay, interesting. So, and the convolution layer, what, what it does exactly? So, the, we, we, the, just the, the max pool layer is like the projector. It, 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 it sees, you know, a huge two-dimensional array, so multi, but let's say one dimension just of red pixels. It sees just the red pixels and creates, you know, a smaller, uh, less uh, precise, of course. This is because we are losing yes. precision, right? We have to lose the precision to have predictions. So there's like less precise, like a little bit blurred, right? Uh, if this is my understanding. Uh, it is actually completely the, the rescaling, downsizing, because it, it yeah. takes like a neighborhood of four images and take the image with, with the maximum intensity. And th th that's a simple algorithm behind it. So as a result, you get image that is uh, twice smaller in size after each uh, pooling layer. So th th there's really nothing, uh, not, not, no magic there, J just uh, two times smaller images. But... Uh, another thing that we haven't talked so far is so, so called channels in the in each of these layers mm -hmm. so uh, we but, said but that before you do it uh, it was actually my mistake so i started with the middle layer the max pool layer but uh, mm -hmm. we didn't cover the first layer the convolution layer right so the, what i understood yes. you have always yeah, convolution max pool convolution max pool this is like a sandwich so yes. the convolution yes. what uh, what what is the convolution about why we need it well we need it to to uh, uh, detect patterns in images. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, all these uh, effects in Photoshop th that you can see, they are using a kind of uh, image, image pre-processing, uh, image processing technique that is based on convolution, you know. Mm -hmm. So with convolution, you have like a filter, you have like a small uh, square, uh, three times three or five times five pixels that you slide over the entire image and you know you know you apply it on each position in the image mm -hmm. and then you can enhance edges or you can 
detect horizontal lines or detect uh, vertical lines or detect uh, certain uh, uh, colored uh, patterns in, in the pixels and something like that. So that is performed using convolution. So convolution like is basic, really basic image pre-processing techniques. And by the way, there are also uh, uh, classes for convolution in, in Java. Uh, Java is the imaging MPI, which is a little bit different, but uh, essentially uh, the same. And uh, uh, the main magic of the deep learning is that uh, you usually when you want to apply some filter, you need to know exactly which numbers you're going to use in th this small matrix to be to apply to filter to like if you want to extract edges on your phone, the, the horizontal or vertical lines. But the magic of uh, deep learning and convolutional networks is that these values for these convolutional filters are being automatically uh, uh, detected uh, during the, the training process. You know? So we made the discovery of the, the these uh, settings uh, as a part of the training process. Before uh, oh. convolutional networks, people had to, like image processing aspects, had to manually figure out which type of filters and with what settings they are going to use in order to pre-process images. And with the uh, uh, convolutional networks, that, that, that part of the job has become part of the training uh, process. So, so using so, so my understanding, I, I, just, I would like to repeat the convolution. So what you told is like three by three pixel uh, square think which slides over the image so my understanding is you know yes. the pixels are changing color color uh, no not color uh the the uh, brightness because color is always the same is uh, r g r b right we are sliding uh, uh, yeah. by by one one color and if the color ch uh, sorry if the brightness changes of the pixels then something happens right so we get signal so if everything is the same yes. nothing happens so it's yes. just black image so there will be nothing but what happens if we have you know black 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 and then white square what what happens then so what 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 the convolution network does with this information it creates a signal and sends to the next layer or what happens then yes it creates a signal and sends it to, to the next layer and actually uh, th there is not just the one convolutional filter in each convolutional filter you can have a several of these feature detectors, you know. So one might be detecting uh, a white pixel on the black surrounding. The other might be detecting uh, a green pixel. Uh, and the third one might be detecting a green uh, and blue pixel and different com combinations. And these channels in each convolutional layer detect, uh, react to different patterns in, in the input, you know. So you, you, you can detect multiple features. Usually we, we it starts with like a 64, 64 like feature detectors for, for like a bigger networks and even bigger, like 128. Oh. Uh, in my experience, you don't need that much features, but again, it really depends uh, of the type of the input image and the problem you're working with. So, so the recognizers there are just the sliders, right? So you said 64, just like, you know, the squares moving around the picture and uh, and they are reacting to various things, to brightness, to intensity yes. and whatever. Yes. And yes. that many, yes. 60, yes. 64 different, different, how to call it, patterns. Which are... feature, feature detector, pattern detectors. Uh, yes. Okay. Feature is a pattern. Is feature and pattern the same? Well, yes, yes. Patterns, yeah. The, the, the patterns, well, depends how, how you look at it, but uh, you're looking in you know, the patterns of the of the um, uh, pixels in images, and you again, you can say those are the uh, important features when you say if the image contains uh, uh, specific types of angles and ranges and uh, pattern combinations. Ah, so the feature would be I'm searching for... Uh, Hard, hard shape or hard line, right? And this yes. is the feature. Yes. And yes. this could uh, yes. involve multiple patterns because to recognize that we need, yes. you know, uh, yes. Uh, yes. color changing pattern, whatever. Okay, so got it. So yeah. we need the convolution just for images, right? I would say to 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 to, to recognize changes in images or no changes in any byte arrays, right? It doesn't have to be an image. 
It doesn't have to be image. Yes, it is even there, even being used for uh, text processing, natural language processing. They can be used also for like uh, audio processing. So exactly. because th- this kind of convolution, uh, like uh, in signal processing theory, you know, y- you can uh, use it to to find a pattern uh, in a signal. You know, so mm-hmm. so like you are using like a template matching. You know, the, the, that's the easiest thing. You find a, te- a template of a pattern and then you compare it at uh, each position of, of, of the signal well basically uh, that's it and it can be applied to any kind of signal just in this case it is uh, being applied uh, to images and uh, uh, technical term uh, that's uh, it's not the real convolution in a mathematical sense because convolution in a mathematical sense is uh, just basically composition of a uh, function with uh, some integral uh, it is called cross correlation. So, but, but so basically, it, it is a sliding window uh, uh, over the the image. Or sliding any, window over image. So recently, I did a, 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 a some some projects with streaming and Kafka, and we had sliding windows mm-hmm. over messages. So actually, uh, mm-hmm. we we could actually pick some values from there, and they are actually interesting values because there was a production data. And uh, use it, and uh, you know, use convolution network to to search for anomalies. Right? We can say, you know, all the products yes. have to look yes. the same. Okay, I got it. So, uh, or, or temperature, yes. right? We can have an array of uh, temperature measurements. And this is very simple. I mean, yeah. what is well array, and I could just uh, read and and recognize the changes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, now I got you. So what it means is, if we are just uh, we have a let's say huge images, large images. So then we will probably mm-hmm. need more uh, the uh, convolution and max pool layers, right? To reduce the size to something smaller, right? Yes. So yes. Also? Yes. Okay. So it's image the, size the and... Images, the more features, you, you need more layers, basically. The, 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 and exact, exact number, of, it is, it is, at the moment, it is impossible to say that the way that people are throwing that is like using... Automated this auto ML like generating different architectures and trying out what works or not, mm-hmm. and uh, part of it part of it uh, is available also in the la- last release of uh, deep nets, but just for the feed forward networks, still not available for convolutional, but in future releases it will be also this automated procedure of uh, ex- experimenting and uh, tweaking the the models. Super interesting. So it means for the Dukes, we need uh, convolution, max pool convolution. And then uh, let's say what I will see visually, because what you have is a kind of if, uh, like a flow diagram looks like in your, uh, you have like, you know, yes. the boxes and the line. So uh, you will probably see how, how to call it, how how much the the model or model, the input is already reduced. So we can stop with the layers, right? This I will recognize in your yes. chart, in your diagram. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. So and at the end we need a different layer. You said. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, well, at the end you have uh, we have output layer. The output layer pro- provides like a prediction, but in between the usually the last max pooling layer, mm-hmm. the last box convolutional max pooling layer, uh, there are a few fully connected layers which uh, like uh, perform classification. So they they uh, transform these uh, inputs uh, and. And uh, combinations of uh, features from pixels extracted from pixels, and try to to uh, like uh, map them to to to, to write probability. So basically, these fully connected layers are trying to divide that input space and say, okay, these type images with this belongs to this category, with, and images with these pixels belong to uh, the other category. So and, and this is uh, which layer is it? Again, this is the uh, fully it connected. Is called, it is called the fully connected layer. Fully connected layer. Uh huh. And uh, why fully connected? Okay. Because it it just uh, reads everything and and writes. There is no there is no projection, right? Or why is fully connected? Uh, it does it, it it does perform a projection. However, it, it is it is it is using a different pattern of connectivity. The fully connected layers, each input of fully connected layer is connected to all outputs uh, for, from in a previous layer. Okay. So the, that's how. And while uh, with the uh, convolutional layers, you don't connect all uh, 
all inputs to all outputs from previous layer. You only connect to a specific region of five times five or so three times three, three pixels. And that's how you, with convolutional layers, actually uh, save a lot of connections and lots of computational uh, power, you know? So mm -hmm. that's the difference. So con convolutional layers use, use like a, a sparse connectivity while fully connected e e layers are using uh, like a dense, fully connected uh, connectivity pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay, got you. So we have the fully connected layer and they are uh, already classifying. And, uh, yes. and, the, and the last layer is? Uh, the, the output layer. The output layer uh, gives, uh, it's using a mathematical function called softmax and it, it, it gives probabilities, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, actually it, it depends uh, if you're using a, a binary classification like in Duke's example, uh, then it is using a, a sigmoid function and uh, it gives like a probability for a single class. Mm -hmm. And if you have multiple classes, then it is using like a softmax function, which kind of gives a normalized probability for uh, several classes. Okay. So basically it, it is same as fully connected layer, just by using a different function, it performs different, different uh, role in the network. Okay, so and and the model, what I get is this a jar. The model, then, if it's fully trained, what I get out? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, you can you can pack it as a jar. Basically, when you 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 working in Java code, you get a serialized uh, DNet file. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this uh, environment, you can just right click this uh, DNet file and pack it uh, as a jar. Ah, uh, ah. Is this Java serialized DNet file? Yes, yes. Then, uh, just by uh, no, not accident, I, I now the, uh, I know the guys from uh, JCon conference, uh, nice guys, and they have an open source uh, free serializer called MicroStream. And mm -hmm. the interesting part is you can serialize uh, Java graphs without even having you know the serializable interface. It, this is crazy fast and is not Java specific. So the CLI's model is longer compatible. So uh, I, yeah. I I played with that. It's interesting if you like. You can look at this because uh, it is. But we get another dependency. It is the problem. But <laughs> but uh, interesting serialization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but if there are some uh, features that uh, and maybe uh, solves problems for someone, why not? Yeah. Yeah. No, just just this was because uh, I I thought about microstream and now you came with serialization. This was just yeah. Uh, Thought okay, so mm -hmm. I get this. Uh, okay, I get the serialized Java objects, the, the serialized Java model. How to use that? Yeah. Well, you you can just uh, deserialize it, and uh, uh, you you get the instance of the train network in your application, and then you feed input to your to that neural network, and you get uh, the prediction. Yeah, but what For I would example, like to have is a exactly the, as as nice API as DeepNet. So I would like to have you know. Uh, um, Give is the image a duke a method, and I pass you know a byte array of the image, and I would like to have you know the the and a float or double back with the probability whether it is a duke or not. This is what I would like to have. How to implement that? So we need a single method, right? Yes, the, 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 that's exactly what the Visrec API is. That's this JSR three eight one. Okay, it, it, it gives you exactly that. And it, it can work with different machine learning models and libraries and with different types of images. And you're implementing and the, this, the, this, this JSR? Uh, yes, it is big. I think even on this tutorial, there is, uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, below this uh, uh, video, there is example of uh, like you have a few, few lines of code that shows you how to, how to use it. You know? So what I'm searching so for, a no, con convenient way to get either a Maven module, this is what I will need, because I guess we will have to retrain the model often, right? So we need a process, like a pipeline, machine learning pipeline, right? So, yes, yeah, yes, big, yes. So, so yeah. What, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm looking for right now is, uh, in my enterprise Duke recognition project, is to, you know, to train the model, then get a jar, then embed the jar in my service and use it. So this is what we have to do. So what are the exact steps with deep nets to achieve that? Well, uh, I mean, uh, you, when you generate jar, you can import it into Maven, right? Yeah. And but you, but you, you can generate a jar. You can generate a jar, right? Yeah. 
Okay. Yes, yes. You can know, only generate jar and uh, you can put whatever you want information in its manifest file or you need uh, when you're importing into Maven like a binary, yeah, th 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 you know? this this is not a problem. What I'm, what I'm what I probably will do is I will embed the entire thing in a in a Maven project anyway, and then uh, and then uh, your model will generate a serialized object graph, and then I will read mm -hmm. the object graph with a Maven plugin into the jar and load it and wrap it. Right, this is what what needs to happen. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's how how it can work. I mean, it, it, one thing. That's really nice. Is that uh, usually one of the challenges is to like, like lots of uh, like experiment experiment management and what uh, what worked the best and how do you log all this information and know what you have been using for training the model and uh, for building some models. So after a few months, uh, when you realize you need to do it again, you have all the information and as you mentioned it. Uh, all this information is already contained within configuration file, you know. So maybe all this information for building model can be included in manifest the file, you know. So when you come back and need to rebuild the model, then you can uh, start from that from that uh, uh, configuration and use use the same data or uh, add more data with new examples that you figure out during the production, you know. Okay, so that's. So, uh, I, so uh, why I'm asking because uh, we did some machine learning and uh, w in one project was with Kafka. So uh, the uh, the training happened uh, in in a service and then the ready to use model was just a message in Kafka. You know, so we listened to the message this and then we read the model oh. and, and this was an update. And um, and I thought uh -huh. that, you know, with you, with DeepNet is even 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 in more interesting and now i'm working a lot uh in in clouds in asia and aws mainly and mm -hmm. um this would mm -hmm. be not kafka maybe kinesis so we would have uh a machine learning service which just you know i, I can send images it just uh, learns so it runs in the entire time let's say uh on um asia was asia app service or on aws would be fargate so they 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 they, they run entire time and and i i can just you know feed the images and then I'm done. So I will send a rest request. Now you 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 are okay. Go for it. And this and now something has to be happened, right? So um, uh, in your case, I would say it's fine because then I only will need the serialized model. The serialized yes. model is just a message. I will send the message out to Kinesis. This will trigger a CI/CD pipeline, and the CI/CD pipeline with the, all the magic with jars, Maven. And 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 even this would be the best thing, it will check in the ready to use model to Nexus. And yes, then I yes, have the, yes. and then I have the new version. And as a developer, I'm just you know referring to the jar, embedding into my microprofile Corcus application. I'm ready to go. So this is what I thought about the entire time how to automate that. But uh, because it's Java, is even easier in my world. You know. Yes. So, Yes, 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 definitely. I mean, this is like uh, maintaining the model is really one of the challenges and keeping the old information in history. But uh, that's the whole point. If we use the existing Java infrastructure and tools, it really solves, uh, it uh, re you reuses solutions for the, that are already out there and every, all the Java developers uh, knows how to use them. There is existing infrastructure, so it makes a lot of things easier, and that's why one of the reasons why uh, machine learning and deep learning for Java. Yeah, uh, because you know the main feature is also Maven, so we get you know the consistent versioning yeah. and repeatable builds. So um, okay, nice. So um, how fast is the model? So let's see. Uh, just thinking about the Duke. Let's say uh, I would like to recognize. Uh, I have a camera running. And I would like to recognize mm -hmm. whether uh, you know uh, uh, someone in front of, of of my of my house is, for instance, uh, a UPS man, someone from the family, or a dog. Um, is it mm -hmm. fast enough to do that? Or uh, yes, but uh, it cannot recognize the, the, the directly a video. You know, you just extract a specific yeah. image. You just yeah. take a photo yeah. snap. Yes, of course, it is fast enough to do that. It cannot. It is not fast enough to do real time video. But uh, the things like that to recognize someone, it, it, it is. 
It, it doesn't have to do right. The camera could uh, pick, uh, take you know one second uh, snapshots of pictures, and and this yes, yes, it doesn't have yes, to be a video. Yes. So this would be even cheaper camera. This yes. this could work. Yes. And um, yeah, and this could run on Raspberry Pi or something. Not a problem, right? Uh, no, you know, yeah, it, it could it could run, but it depends also on the size of the yeah, image. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Run. If I have a feed with no eight K image, it it may be problematic. Of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another That's question. Good, exactly. um, GPU does it help you or not? At, at the moment, we don't have GPU. We mm -hmm. just and well, that's one of the things we just uh, are using plain Java threading, you know. Yeah. So multi threading in Java and uh, it uh, frees you from the dependency of uh, you know GPU and yeah, sure. uh, these uh, native 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 libraries. Uh, it uh, but uh, the, the interesting thing is that it, it is very optimized implement, implement, implementation. So. It, it that provides like a comparable performance for inference. And uh, in a recent use case uh, on Android, uh, with a blog published on FUJ uh, by Gertrude, uh, it is uh, uh, showing that uh, it has really like a, only uh, a little bit slower than the solutions that are using uh, GPUs. But so you are also still using. You are investigating GPUs, or you say no? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, we are investigating GPUs, and I, I think we definitely go with the uh, uh, compatibility with TensorFlow, uh, and probably uh, supporting uh, NVIDIA GPUs like QDNN. So th th there are many different things uh, when it comes to GPUs, but it, it is uh, really uh, the next era area of innovation. You know, lots of so deep learning accelerators and chips are being available, mm -hmm. and uh, it is an important decision to to see which GPUs and which specific features to to to, to support, mm -hmm. and it will probably depends a lot of the use case and these initial customers. And have you the chance to test, you know, the Apple M1 chip, the performance? No, no. Th 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 this would be interesting uh, uh, because it has unified yes. memory, and uh, this could be an uh, interesting, you know, uh, benchmark for your for your. Uh... Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you're going with the specialized chips, you really need to use the, the, their very specific drivers and so on. But, but I mean, with Project Panama, what, when it becomes ready, the, the things could become uh, much easier, you know. And and uh, Project Loom could be a benefit for you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, okay. I think only Panama would be relevant. Uh, if you want to really use GPU, then you would probably go with with, with uh, Panama. Not, not GPU, but, but, but lo lots of threads, you know. This is what I thought. If you need lots of threads, then maybe, you know, Project Loom would be interesting for you, no? Yes, it can be make it faster, but, uh, you know, if you, if you want to do it in a way that it is being done, you know, TensorFlow and other deep learning frameworks, you just put everything on the GPU, it does the job, and you yeah. get the results back. So you, and all the threading, everything is going on the GPUs. So now, uh, this deep nets is also commercial. So what, what what I get for free and what I have to pay for and what I get for, for this. So how this works? Well, uh, we do have a, like a flexible licensing model and uh, we give for free for development so to build the pilot projects, uh, prototypes. And uh, when you want to, to put it to production, depending on, depending on the volume, number of applications of users and so on, then we come to someone like a a reasonable pricing for a specific use case. So that's something that is still uh, very flexible, but you can see if it works for you and if it works for you and if it's making you money, okay, that, then we can uh, see see how it can work uh, with partnership for both of us. And do you have thought and about, uh, if you, let's say, uh, an, an open source developer who just tries you know, to recognize Docs or Lego creatures or something like this, it, can it be also used or is it? I mean, yes, of course, of course, it is free for personal use. Ah, free, free for personal for use and in commercial use. So it is. So you get money for it. So if I'm using this in commercial space, then I w this is just no n normal. Yes. I will. I would yes. have to contact you and you just pay with it. You can pay how, how much as you like. Yeah. But if you're making out for me, you. It's a fair to give us a, a bit of it. <laughs> okay, uh, very good. So if you are, you know, the next next interview with you, 
And uh, I will see, you know, that you're the third richest man after, you know, Elon Musk. So I know it, it worked out for you. Or or you, in the next conference, the Deep Nets conference, you yes. will announce your personal okay. personal robot, you know, like Elon Musk. Yeah, so this is, yeah this is my personal robot. And it works completely uh -huh. with Deep Nets. And uh, I started... A yeah. It's uh, the, the doing things for us and interviews and stuff. <laughs> well, perfect. So, uh, I yeah. It it was great, so I, uh, it was fun for me and uh, a nice project. So where people can find, you know, deep nets or you, and how can you give money in all the commercial projects? So how how so how it works? So first, the homepage is deepnets.com. Deep is uh, two e's and two t's and dot com. Deep nets. I will put it in yes. show notes. Now, um, and how how they can reach you if they would like consulting or you know licensing or whatever. Yeah, it's, you can use it Twitter and uh, yeah, there is a download when they download, uh, just follow the instructions on the website. They can download and get, get the, like the initial evaluation license, free, free license. And then, yeah, from that point, they can either email me or using contact form on Twitter anyway or on LinkedIn anyway. They, 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 they are used to and feel comfortable. Uh, I'm there. We are there. Our team is there. Yeah, thank you. So it's, uh, it was a really interesting discussion and see you next time. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward. And, and let me know how does your example uh, with the uh, Duke recognition yeah. works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs>